my talk is on like network engineering and and how it kind of moved towards a DevOps movement. Um, but I'm going to make like a very interesting statement here. So, you know, having been in network engineering for 14 years and then looking at something like Service Mesh, to me, Service Mesh is just a, basically a VPN at this point. Um, but the reason why I say that is because a lot of the technologies that I've seen over the last 14 years have effectively gone full circle. And so let me go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Marino Wijay. Uh, I am a Canadian, so I flew all the way out here to see y'all and hang out and, you know, hang out with the KubeCon crew and, and whatnot. Um, I am a developer advocate at Solo, which focuses on application networking, so things like API gateways and service meshes. Um, I've been in the tech industry for probably about 18 years now, but spent the majority of that doing network engineering and, and variations of it. Uh, but part of the reason why I'm giving this talk today is because I noticed that we were leaving behind the network engineers as we progressed forward with microservices and containers and the whole Kubernetes movement. And so I'm here for the network engineers, the ones that literally want to transform their careers and, um, and take their network engineering skills and go dev oopsie. So my journey started off like when I um, you know, went to a, a computer store and decided to buy a wireless router, like one of those 802.11b uh, 802 routers with, um, with a wireless adapter and whatnot, because I, I wanted to get internet in my room. And um, when people started to see me do these kinds of things, they asked me, they called me up and they're like, hey, can you set up something very similar for me at home? And I'm like, sure, I'll charge you however much you want me to charge you and, and we'll get going. Um, and I started to realize how much I truly enjoyed networking altogether, just seeing like packets flow and move around. Um, but I realized like setting up wireless networks wasn't just it. And so I want you to, for one second, just imagine an OSI model. Actually, I won't do that to you. I'll actually show you an OSI model. Um, so the OSI model, I, I kind of started at the very bottom there where you see the physical layer. Um, but what I tried to call out here is that there are a lot of vendors, a lot of technologies that kind of flowed through this, this OSI model from layers one all the way up to layer seven. And my journey as I started in layer one, as I moved up that stack to focus a little bit more on layer four and came to layer seven, I started to see, oh my gosh, these patterns are the exact same. And so um, let's, let's talk a little bit more about that and what that actually looked like. So I had to start my journey um, to learn like networking. And the best way to start it was to actually go the certification route. It was like 2008 and I was sitting in a network closet configuring a bunch of Dell switches, plugging things in, not really understanding if things were working, but I just like, I plugged and prayed to, to see if things would move around. And uh, the person I was working with at the time, they were remote, but they hopped on the phone with me. They were reviewing configs and I'm like, hey, how did you figure out all of this stuff? And, and they went like, hey, I'm a civil engineer, I build roads, and I, know, I, I love to know what's going on those roads. But I started by chasing after a certification to better understand you know, how these, these little devices connect to each other, how I plug in a, a console cable and configure like a router or something like that. And so what I ended up doing was chasing that certification dragon for probably a good five to six years. Um, so I progressed through a well-known vendor's um, certification track, and then I got to a point where I realized like, oh shit, this is not, this is actually not for me anymore. Like I did not want to put myself or subject myself to that level of torture of going all the way to somewhere like RTP in North Carolina to write an exam where you're literally in a lab environment for like eight hours straight. That just wasn't me anymore. And so um, as I kind of moved beyond that, I started to focus a little bit more on the data center and the storage elements of the data center networks. So what that meant was like I was dealing with storage area networks, fiber channel, iSCSI, and all that fun stuff. Um, but I, I saw this pattern. I'm like, okay, this is the exact same pattern that you would see in a networking environment, except I'm just moving a bunch of different kinds of packets all together. Um, and so I spent time building out SAN environments, learning and perfecting my, my knowledge in something called fiber channel over ethernet, only to realize that it would become deprecated and not used like a few years later on. Um, and so um, when I think about that, I, I had to transform as an individual, but I wasn't really sure how I was going to go about doing it. Um, I was confused. You know, I, I thought I had reached the, the pinnacle of my network engineering career, 
And, um, and then I realized, oh my gosh, there is just so much crap that I have to deal with as a network engineer. Um, I just simply can't do it. Like imagine in networking, you have to configure devices. You have to configure routers. You have to configure switches. You have to tell them what they need to do and what packets to move around. But try doing that for a thousand different devices only to realize that you have thousands of different configurations and you have to manage them all. And uh, if you have an error in any one of them, you might be spending a lot of time trying to figure out what's going on. Um, going back to the storage networking realms, there, were some, there, was a, there was a concept called zone merges that you would do with fiber channel switches, um, where you would merge multiple virtual fabrics together so that you could have this host access a disk, um, and that disk is known as a LUN through something called a worldwide networking name. Now, if you mess something up, your zoning was way off, your LUNs would not map to your hosts, and guess what, your virtual machines would never power on. That was, it was just misconfiguration. And so I started to think like, why did we ever not have Git back then? Like where was Git when I was struggling to maintain like five different config files on 20 different laptops um, to, to be able to at least come out of that network strong? Um, but it's, it's here today, like Git is there today and people are using it actively. Uh, but what's more important is the, the element of these patterns of like you're creating something you're having to iterate on a configuration, you're having to make changes, you're having to manage the life cycle of that configuration. And this is no different than what developers do. Like I'll create some, some small application, I'll upload it or I'll, I'll push it to Git, and then someone else can access it and, and make changes, collaborate, et cetera. But what about network engineers? We needed to do that too. And so you know, as networking kind of evolved, uh, we got smart. And we started to automate a lot of things. Uh, we would automate the network, we would automate VLANs, we would automate as much routing as we possibly could, um, but we also needed a framework in which we can operate out of. And so that framework actually happened to be things like Python. There were Python libraries developed for us to be able to effectively configure our networking devices, right? In fact, like a lot of the vendors out there started publishing APIs that you can interact with. They were based off of like NetConf and RESTConf, um, and even like the open daylight controller. Uh, but effectively, these were the underpinnings of something called software-defined networking. Except we were just automating things. We were creating scripts, we were creating Python scripts that we would just push to our management layer that would go out to configure devices. And we weren't having to plug in a console cable anymore. So that was effectively net DevOps. Um, there was a, a new system that came out too called Napalm, which is effectively a a multi-vendor system or platform where you could deploy your, yeah, you deploy your effect, your, your whatever configurations you want and it could push to as many devices, different types of devices. So that was like some serious true network automation. Um, now, once we got past that, like we, we started seeing another movement. And this was this whole movement around software-defined networking where I'm like building virtual networks on top of physical networks. And these virtual networks were, were like, they could be spun up and destroyed as quickly and as, as efficiently as you wanted to. But the challenge with that is that you now had like so many other things to worry about. You had to worry about if you had enough overhead on your switches to support something like an overlay protocol or an overlay um, mechanism like VXLAN for that matter. But the whole reason we moved to this, this whole space was because the cloud movement and what they were doing in the cloud, they were creating these virtual networks anyways and in the physical world, in data centers, in closets, we needed to do the exact same thing. And so software-defined network really, software-defined networking really changed that paradigm altogether. It allowed us to um, move beyond like the physical devices, move beyond boundaries that we never thought we could before because at this point, I just need IP connectivity and I got my own networks wherever, wherever I want them to be. Um, and then, I come to find that we also started virtualizing the, the WAN as well. Um, how many of you have played with IPsec before? Right, so you probably you know, sat there configuring two PICs or a a ASA devices or two firewalls to create that tunnel. Someone probably fat fingered a, uh, a passphrase or something like that or a certificate and then it, um, the tunnel never comes up, right? So 
you know, we, we realized how much of a problem that was and we tried our best to automate that. We did with Python, but we took it another level and we decided to give you a UI or UIs or, or APIs where you can configure all of these WAN networks and IPsec without ever having to worry about touching a config file at all. And so SD-WAN actually took the industry by storm only to realize that it was just a necessary part of the puzzle um, and it would become so downplayed that no one really cared about it anymore. And so as I was starting to see this, I started to get bored of network engineering. Like things were just like so automated. There was, there was no excitement in what we were doing. BGP kind of did its own thing and it was always gonna be around. So what now, what next? Um, and that's how we arrived at something called Kubernetes. Um, so Kubernetes, what, was launched seven years ago now? Eight years ago? 20, what was it, 2016? Yeah, so six years ago. Is my math right? Yeah, that's right, okay. Um, so at that time, like, there, was, there was a lot of magic behind it. Like, we honestly didn't know what we were doing, what we were working with. But in fact, what, what it really came down to was we were working in the Linux kernel creating networking namespaces for that isolation. We were basically messing around with the kernel so that we could run IP tables to be able to basically use something called NAT to basically give us more life in the IPv4 world, which I'm not gonna talk about right now, that's another story. But I realized that Kubernetes itself actually created a paradigm shift in which we were doing networking. Like we actually did not give a shit anymore about that physical network as long as it was there. I can build my, my Kubernetes control plane and my data plane, and then I can deploy any kind of network I wanted to. And that's when that true DevOps or net DevOps movement started happening because now everything started moving over to microservices, containers. Like how do I, how do I make sure that container A is communicating with container B, but oh, oh, by the way, container A can die at any time and come back to life in a totally different form. And I change my IP, so what the hell? Like what am I doing? So one of the really interesting concepts that I saw in Kubernetes to address the networking was labels. Like labels is a very, very powerful mechanism to be able to mark traffic, route traffic, be able to determine if traffic from like, let's say namespace A can communicate with namespace B or something along those lines. And that was a very cool damn movement because now you can basically take your networking stack and just shove it in YAML. But I'm not gonna show you any YAML today, sorry. Um, the other thing that I also noticed is that the same challenges we had in the physical world, in the non-container world, existed in the container world. Like if, you're, if your DNS was off, guess what? You're never gonna be able to, nothing can communicate. If your time was off, like the network time protocol was off, guess what? Things are out of sync, right? If your MTU was off, things can't communicate, things can't fit through that road anymore and now things will be half broken in terms of communication. And so this is networking all over again. Literally, we are looking at networking technologies that are the underpinnings of our physical network, of our Kubernetes network, of our virtual networks. So again, another intentionally uh, slide that's, that's blank, but the idea is that now in Kubernetes, I have, a, is a, I have a, what we call a container networking interface, right? That's our, I would say our switching layer or our layer two layer. And that's where we're able to create a data plane where you know, con containers can talk effectively and we could do some really interesting routing. But then what if we want to get very creative at layer seven? And so we started to see how API gateways took storm. Um, you know, we're, we're becoming very Kubernetes native, would create these ideas of upstreams for all these different services that you would need to route to. And you would have this like, front door firewall effectively that just sat at the front of your Kubernetes cluster and just accepted traffic based off of a variety of different conditions. Uh, but we needed more. Like literally if I had one single point of failure, that's not, that's not enough for me. That's not what I want. That's not how we want to approach things. And so we kind of arrived at something called service mesh. So service mesh for, for, the, uh, for those that aren't aware is pretty much a technology that sits at layer seven that allows us to do some very interesting traffic engineering. Um, it allows us to inject security and it allows us to just see observability patterns. It's a layer on top of Kubernetes. But these three key things that I just said were things that were pretty much in like any kind of VPN setup that you would do. So 
in, in the security realms with respect to a service mesh, you're using something called MTLS or mutual TLS. And that's just effectively creating a secure tunnel between two endpoints, which is no different than creating a VPN tunnel between two endpoints. So you know, it kind of goes along with what I said earlier, service mesh is just a VPN, but it's actually more. Um, we also, I also started to notice that you know, the command that I have on there, Istio proxy config, or what is it called, Istio proxy config route, is basically outputting a routing table. If you are a network engineer and you do a show IP route, it is outputting a routing table. Same concept. And so the patterns are effectively the same. Like there's nothing that has changed. Um, we have just basically cosmetically changed how we approach things. We've automated things. We've made things a little bit easier, more consumable. But then we started putting networking in every single YAML. Now I have an interesting story about this. So about three weeks ago, I went out to three. Yeah, three weeks ago, I went out to rally uh, to to just attend a DevOps days, and it just so happened that the DoD was there, Department of Defense, and we got into talking about some things, and then they introduced me to someone um, that wasn't part of the DoD, and I just got into a conversation with them about like just the patterns of networking in Kubernetes, and they're like, let me just tell you what I've been doing in Kubernetes. I'm using Kubernetes with something called Kubevert, with the Malta CNI, with the Cisco CSR 1000V. And I'm like, what are you doing with all of that? I've, I've effectively created a, a network edge for my needs. And I sat there and I thought about that for a minute. And I asked him, did you deploy all of that in YAML? Yes, absolutely. And so when you think about the networking side of things, especially when it comes to Kubernetes, all of that now can be easily defined in YAML. I can create routing configs, I can create po access policies, I can create um, pretty much anything I want, like a pool of IPs for my containers to consume. And that's what's really interesting because, guess what, 12 years ago, I was doing all of the exact same things, just in a, in a spreadsheet, in an Excel spreadsheet, unfortunately, because we did not have um, all those tools, right? So, you know, fast forward today, fast forward to all the way to today. We're DevOps, you know, we have Kubernetes, we have this massive cloud native ecosystem, and we have Service Mesh, which is providing us all these capabilities. But if you look up there, Service Mesh is a router, Service Mesh is a VPN, is Service Mesh um, a system for, you know, PRTG or MRTG? Technically it is, because it's offering those observability points. In fact, like, what we did with Service Mesh, and specifically, let's talk about the Istio service mesh, because I'm most familiar with that. We took the Envoy proxy, a highly functional layer four, layer seven router, and just layered abstraction on top of that. We put that router right beside a container. What did we do? We effectively just re-engineered everything. We, we went network engineering hard mode, and we decided we're gonna put routers everywhere, except I have a control plane that's able to push configs to wherever I want, whenever I want, so this is easy to manage. And that's how we, we got here. Um, we got to this point where we're, we're realizing we need, we need to bring routing closest to the source, but we also need these very interesting ways to create traffic patterns for our needs, because guess what? Our microservices are evolving. I wanna be able to do CI, CD with them, and I wanna be able to do blue greens and canaries and all of that fun stuff without ever impacting production. But how we were able to do it 12 years ago is the exact same way we're doing it today, except we're using cloud native technologies. So the moral of this story is that for the network engineers that have basically you know, sat there thinking like, where do I fit into this whole DevOps movement? Service mesh, CNIs, API gateways, Kubernetes even for that matter, because it's so networking heavy and focused, is where you want to go next, because that's where I went. And I ended up doing that by following the packet. Um, and what I mean by following the packet, I'm literally using Wireshark and, um, and, it, and, and uh, oh my gosh, TCP dump in Linux to really figure out where things are moving, who's talking to who, because at the end of the day, that is what network engineering is. We want to see the packets. We want to follow them end to end. So. You know, to the network engineers out there, you have a place out here, you are welcome. I'm, you know, you, if you are out here today, you're welcome to come talk to me and I'll tell you a little bit more about that journey. I'll tell you how now I basically configure all my networking in YAML because I don't have to worry about 
managing multiple configs. I've got a system that's, that's so clean. It's Kubernetes, and it's taking care of a lot of different things for me. So that being said, I want to thank you all for uh, attending. I, you know, I intentionally wanted to be short on this, this talk because I know how we all love breaks and how I don't like talking that much. Um, but I want to thank you all. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank you for joining my talk on Network Engineering Goes DevOopsie. Service Mesh is just a VPN, but it's also so many things more than just that. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>